Welcome to the Get Your Ass Up Podcast. I'm Tony, the closer. I'm here to inspire and motivate you to never give up on your dreams. As a former NFL athlete who overcame personal setbacks like going to jail and bankruptcy, I turned my life around to become one of the top salesmen in the world. And this podcast will feature celebrity guests, successful entrepreneurs, and my incredible network to give you real-world advice on how to achieve success in all aspects of life. Whether you're looking to build a successful business, achieve financial freedom, or simply need some motivation to keep pushing forward, we've got you covered. Man, we've had amazing celebrity guests on here like Dame Dash, T.I., my boy Joe Hayden, and Edrian James, Andre Berto, and more, sharing their stories and insights on how to reach their full potential. Listen, so are you ready to get your ass up and achieve your dreams? Hit that subscribe button right now so you never miss an episode of the Get Your Ass Up podcast with me, your boy Tony the Closer. Let's dive in. Let's change your life together. Let's go. If work don't wake you, I ain't going to shake you. I'm going to always be an asset. It's like, man, look, how was you? And that's why I can relate to the youth so much. I can relate to people in general because of the fact that I was them. You get that when when your time come, but have fun. You know, go right. do all those things. And I'm not gonna tell you what not to do, but understand that if you do those things, be willing to accept what comes with those things. Right. You know, and that's my way of teaching. We need examples. Absolutely. You know, our culture needs more examples. We need consistent examples that saying like this is what you can do. Depending on the decision that you make, the outcome is going to be there. Are you willing to accept the outcome? I'm always standing up. I'm always about pushing whatever I got going. Yeah, you got to. You know, that, that's what it's Man, about. It's going to be it's going to be so many people that look at this. You want to be you want to get every every bit of it. <clears throat> get them looking, man. Anytime you need me, let's work. Yeah, that, Beyond it, this, you know, yeah, like good yeah. people, like I like like I told you, like I like in like I don't just be just talking just to talk, you know. It's like I'm confident in who I am, so like when I give my when I give a person that respect, I'm like, look, dog, you just you reached out, and I was like, hey, this way I'm, I'm used to people bullshitting, people just talking, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, all right, yeah, whatever. But when you see a person do what they say they're gonna do, them people special in that space, you know, so you always got to sit up there and give them their respect. And that's what I, I always make make it a point of emphasis because it's rare in this world. You know, a lot of people say, hey, yeah, I want to do this. Everybody want to do everything that's convenient. You know, anything that's convenient, yeah, you know, nah, hey, pull up on me. And you pull it up, you want to play, <laughs> and I'll tell you, like, because my schedule don't change. It's like, I created my life, like I always say, create the life you want to live. I created my life to where everything goes around what I'm doing, but if it fits within that, man, I'm here, I'm available, you know? Yeah. And if somebody else, if they got something going on or whatever, and they say, man, look, hey, yeah, give me that little space, and they for real, you gotta give them their props, and you gotta make sure you answer the bell. Well, I appreciate that, brother, and you know, yeah. just so you know, I respect you so much that uh, the minute that I, I got the response back from you, I was actually in the gym. And I keep my team with me as we as I work out. So everything I do, I record, I document. And you changed my whole workout that day. <laughs> I was doing legs, man. And uh, I'm sitting here like, hold on. The Edge done said he down to do an episode with me? Oh, we in the rock. We, we pulling up. He said, tomorrow, y'all, we dropping everything that we doing and we on the way. Uh, one thing about it, I, underst I, I understood in life that that – Opportunities and speed love each other. When you take opportunities and you have them in front of you, you got to take advantage of it. I know I could have probably waited till you came back to Miami or waited till you came back from Indy. I said, no, sir. Yeah. I wanted to let you know how serious I am about having you as a guest on this show. So welcome to the Get Your Ass Up show. We got a Hall of Famer, fourth overall pick. Back, what year was that? Uh, 1999. 1999. Yeah. Uh, we have Edgerin and James. I appreciate you spending time with me today, man. My audience is definitely about to appreciate having a legend, a NFL Hall of Famer on the show today. And brother, thank you so much for taking your time to sit down with me today because uh, just even walking through your establishment, I can see what your life is like. You're not messing around. You got plenty of business going on. Uh, and I wanted to really you know, sit down and pick your brain. Uh, and as I was watching some stuff about you, I realized the businessman that you are. 
And I walked through your building uh, before you got here, and I saw you had your entity structures on the wall. And you like the whole setup. You had multiple. I was like, man, this is he, he's sitting out here. He must be having conversations with my dad because that's something that my dad is really big on. It's having your your uh your your business properly structured, having multiple companies and uh and holding companies and, and, and management companies, et cetera. And I saw that on the wall, I said, man, brother know what he's doing here. But once again, man, thank you so much for taking time to join me on the uh, podcast today. No, nah, man, I appreciate it, man. I tell you, like, I always connect with the real I, and like for me, I'ma kinda get a feel for a person by their approach. You know, I'ma always stay me. But I'm going to put the situation to where it's like, if you really want it, if you want to do it, because I'm not going to tell you no. If I see a brother doing something, I see somebody doing something positive. I don't care if it's a brother or not. But I see a person doing something positive, and especially if it's a brother, you know, I'm going to be like, man, that dog really want to do something, and he's serious about it. Because this world is full of a lot of people that just talk. You know, everybody mm-hmm. talking, everybody want to end up being the end product, but they don't want to go through all the things that it takes to actually become. And so when you see somebody doing something and you see them putting forth the effort, you know, there's no way you can turn them down. You know, you can't turn them down because I used to be that person. You know, I was that person that wished that somebody would listen to me or wish that somebody would be there and step up, you know, because I'm I'm a sponge, you know, so I've always hung around the older people. You know, I've always hung around people that would give me game or kind of advance me. And you have some people that brush you off. A lot of time people brush you off. And it's not that they just brush you off intense, intentionally. They brush you off because they know that everybody is usually just talking. Right. You know, but when you see somebody that's real, you know, it's like the antennas go up. I'm like, yeah, dog, serious. Because I'm like, I say, hey, this is where I'm at. This is my schedule. It's on you now. So it's like, put the ball in your court, you know, and mm-hmm. that's what I started dealing with the, with the kids, you know, because I've, I've always dealt with a, a, a lot of the youth. And it got me to a point where I was kind of getting frustrated because I'm like, listen, man, like, I wish I had a me in my life. And you guys don't understand that, dude, I'm doing this and everything I'm doing is for free. Everything I'm doing is like, straight from the heart and straight from, you know, it's like I'm going walking through my past and I'm sitting back saying, man, like I wish I had this person. So I became that person. And then you start seeing that everybody playing games, everybody not really serious about what they're talking about. This is the stuff I talk <laughs> about all the time, and bro. That's, and that kill, and, and, it, and it used to kill me. So I started saying, you know what? I was, you know, at one time I went through a phase where it's like, you're forcing people, hey, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do that. Man, not, that, that's not the way. You yeah. know, it's 10 people, but it might be one or two that might really grasp it. And so I started saying, you know what? Let me just put it in their hands. I put everything in everybody's hands. If you say you want to do something, all right, I'm going to put it in your hands. If you want to do it, hey, if we got to be up at 6 a.m., at 6 a.m., we're going to work out, we're going to do this round, I'm going to be there. Right. I ain't calling you. My grandfather, he used to say, he had this this saying, my grandfather was a was a contractor and he always led people, but he never asked nobody to do nothing. He would never sit up there and beg nobody. And he would have this thing where he say, if work don't wake you, I ain't gonna shake you. You know, he's like, I ain't waking you up, man. If it's serious enough to you, you'll get up, you'll be there. So I always hung on to that, to where it's, man, look, I ain't chasing you, dog. If it means something to you, look, you'll be there. Mm-hmm. I'ma always be an asset. And I make sure I put myself in a position to be an asset in every situation. If I'm not an asset, I'm gonna try to find a way to become an asset to the person mm-hmm. or to people to where it's like, hey, you want this. Because anything that I want, man, if I if I need you or if I want to do something with you, I wanna be involved with you, I wanna be down, I'm knocking on your door. I'm calling you. I'm going to call you multiple times. You're going to get tired of me calling you because that's what I want. Did I not just say this at uh, dinner a few minutes ago? I was like, hey, man, there's a couple people that I wanted to get. And I said, they're going to either get tired of me 
Or, or they go, they go have to I'm come knocking on your door. Like <laughs> it means something to me. It, it has to mean something more to you than the person. So I'm gonna knock on your door. And I don't, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna belittle myself. Mm-hmm. I'm not gonna sit up and embarrass myself. But I'm gonna do it in a respectable way. But I'm gonna let you know that I'm serious. Right. And a lot of people won't go to that extreme. They they sit up there and say like, man, I ain't chasing nobody. Or they feel like you gotta chase them. And then it's so crazy now that it's it's done trickled down to the kids. I'm like, listen, kid, like, dude, I'm I'm somebody. And you may not see me as somebody because I try to appear as normal, but dude, you don't understand. I'm really somebody and I'm here to help you. Like, you don't have to give me a dime, you know, and it's, and it's like, I'm not coming to you because I need you or because it's something that I get out of it, you know. It's right. just because of an obligation that I feel like, man, I'm looking at myself in a mirror and I'm like, dang, that that was me. Right. And so you, a lot of times it, it can frustrate you. It can put you in a situation where you're like, dang, man, I'm doing all this stuff, but these kids, not they not listening. They hard-headed. I'm like, I ain't chasing no kid. You know what I'm saying? Because the cream rises to the top. Yep. The one that wants to be will be. And everybody else that's playing these games, like after a while, you know, time will kind of tell the story. And time always does it. You know, if you give them – these situations where you put them in and you say, hey, look, if you want me, you call me. And you better be on time. We call it Dungey time. Coach Tony Dungey, mm-hmm. that's, that's like one of the greatest coaches ever. But Tony Dungey time is the meeting. If the meeting's at 6 o'clock, it's starting at 555. We all know that. And anybody that's in tune with the way he do things, you know, you say, hey, I'm going to be early, I'm going to be on time, and I'm going to be ready. Right. I ain't getting there at 6 o'clock and I'm throwing my stuff on. You know, it's like I'm already in the seat, I'm prepared, I'm ready. Like, so I'm moving on dungy time. You know, like if you're serious about something, like step up in here because my time is valuable. Right. You know? and, and a lot <clears throat> of time these the youth don't really understand it because they haven't been through nothing. And nowadays you got so many people that's, that's trying to be their friend or trying to, you know, get close to them and trying to win favor with them, that they'll let them slack. And I'm like, nah, nah, I ain't going that route. Do you feel yourself getting discouraged when you, you know, you got people that you're genuinely spending your time trying to help grow and uh, you feel like they're they're not taking it seriously enough? At first you start to, but I think it's, it's worth an attempt, you know. So I'm always going to put the effort out there, but – the effort as the years has grown, it's become shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. Because you kinda know when people like BSing. Yeah. You know, so you you know it. And it's like, my time is valuable. I'm here to do something to help you. And if you don't want to help, it's somebody else that want it. Right. And the person that want it, it's gonna they gonna really get something good. And the person that don't want it, you know, they're gonna they're gonna see that um, you're just a guy. You just become, right. you know, somebody that wish they would have done this or done that. And so, as life goes on, you get better at it. You know, when you mm-hmm. start out, you know, you put a little bit more effort. But as you get a little older, you start saying like, ah, that's, I done seen this little show before. You know, I've seen this situation before. And it's not just kids; it's adults also. Everybody talking about, I want to have this. I want to have that. Like, what are you doing in your spare time? Like. You can catch me in the club if you if you really in tune with what in the club. I might be on my phone and I'm I'm reading articles. I'm reading things that's going on to better myself. Right. You know. So I'm always trying to look for something that's going to take me to another level. You know, things that could help me. I heard you mention uh, Tony Dungy, and um, obviously, like you know. You've been in, in Indy for, for, for the years that you were there. You guys had some special times there. Um, having somebody like Coach Dungey around who uh, who I, I can tell he's got a lot of respect from so many men. I heard your, your, your acknowledgement of how great of a coach he is. What type of things did you learn uh, having that type of guy around you? I think, you know, when, you, when you're in a space, um, if you're in an NFL space, you know, and not saying that they're wrong, but it's truly a business. But you have somebody that's really understands that, hey, man, look, I know I'm here and I know this is a business, but I'm also a mentor, I'm also a father, and I also understand 
that these kids don't have this or these young men don't have this. So you take a different approach, and that approach is respected league-wide. I mm-hmm. think anybody that has crossed path with the Tony Dungy understands that, look, man, hey, you respect, you, you wish this dude was your daddy. You know what I'm saying? Right. A lot of us come from situations where we don't have hands-on fathers. And I haven't met one person that didn't have a hands-on father and they crossed paths with somebody that was somebody like what they envisioned as a father figure that didn't gravitate to them. Mm-hmm. Like you gravitate to those without even knowing it. You know, you gravitate to them because like, dang, that's, a, that's like a real daddy. And the people who gravitated to, to it the most are the people who didn't have that. Now, if you had your father, you're like, okay, yeah, I had my daddy. I had somebody in my life, you know. But when you don't have that and you see that day in and day out, you know, middle school, high school, college, and you cross paths with a man that like treats you like a man, but like a real like solid dude, it's like you start paying attention. And I'm one of those kids that sit back and say, dang, this dude right here, like, this a cool ass daddy. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, dang, this dude right here pretty cool. He ain't pressing you. You know, it's like, at first you say, okay, Tony Dungeons, he's big in religion, he's big in his studies. And so, you know, you don't know what to expect. Right. And then when you meet him, you say, man, he ain't pushing this church thing on me. He ain't pushing all these rules on me. You know, all he doing is leading by example. And you just gravitate to it. You know, mm-hmm. you just gravitate to it. It's like you always getting people recruiting you. Right. And you always got people recruiting you. Like when you start – especially when you become good. You know, you become good, people start recruiting you high school, they start recruiting you, and people start recruiting you even when you become a pro, people recruit you because they have a different interest. When you have a person just be, and they just become, or not just become, they just are who they are, that stands out. And when you see somebody like that, you're like, dang, dude, like, really got his stuff together. Dude, like, really, like, cool. Right. And so you... You gravitate to those things, so you pay anything you gravitate to, you pay attention to it a little bit more. And you say, "Dang, this right here is this is pretty cool." You know, to be able to be yourself. Right. You know, it's like I was always able to be myself, and it wasn't something that was a conflict of interest. And those are things that always stood out. Like, man, I can be Edge. You know, I can be who I really am, and I'm not really doing nothing wrong, and I'm understood. You know, so. <clears throat> who is Edge? I'm kind of curious. Who, if you had to describe who who Edge is, who is Edge? <laughs> Edge is I don't know who <laughs> Edge is at the time. They, Edge is like so many people because like, Edge is like, man, you cross paths with so many situations to where it's like you are what you've seen, what you've been around. You know, you have these defensive mechanisms. Your Edge is a person that don't really trust nobody. Because you ain't have nobody, you know. So you sit up there and you expect, you like, you look, you in situations where you like, well, I know it's gonna go left at some point, and you just waiting on when, you know. It's like, that's 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 the way you you approach it. But you're easy going. You're like, man, I enjoy life. I enjoy having fun. But it is what it is. So I'm not getting mad at nothing. I'm not tripping on nothing. You know. It's like, they're like, I understand like who's here, who's not here. And I got a chance to witness, okay, I remember I go through high school. You, know, you go through high school, you graduate. You got people that's more popular. They get gifts, they get this, they get that. You don't get nothing. <laughs> you got, you got, <laughs> you know, hey, you graduated, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so that's what it is. And then all of a sudden, you know, all those things that you've seen, all those things that you've witnessed over the years, you know, you start seeing like, okay, yeah, I'm just going to work hard. I don't depend on nobody. Ads don't beg nobody for nothing. Don't ask nobody for nothing. And you just work and you accept life for what it is. You know, I grew up in um, my mom took on the took on the Jehovah Witness um, religion. Mm-hmm. So you don't get nothing. You know, you don't get nothing for Christmas. <laughs> you don't get nothing. So it's like it's like okay, it's cool. So you learn to accept, like man. Every day is a good day. It doesn't matter. Material things don't matter. 
It's like so it give you it gives you the confidence to be without. You know, right. like you have a lot of insecure people. They can, you know, they go around, they mad because they don't have this. I'm like, hey, we don't we don't we don't celebrate Christmas. Mm-hmm. We don't get gifts. We don't never celebrate birthdays. We don't we don't get none of that. You know, so you're accustomed to it. And then all of a sudden you get you come into financial success. And you're able to do all those things, and now you got everybody like, hey, what are you doing for your birthday? What are you doing for this? And you have all none of that stuff matters. So it teaches you like material things are just that. They're just material things. Mm-hmm. And so you so you have a nice foundation. I think the foundation is good yeah. on the back end. It's bad on the front end because as a kid, you would love to get some toys, you know, it's like... It's like you're missing out on everything, yeah. Yeah, I, I just watch people get toys, you know what I'm saying? So, it's like, like even now to the day, I really, and I know a lot of people can't really sit up there and say, I really enjoy when I watch people have success and get things because it's not about me. It never was about me because I grew up and it never was about me. It couldn't be about me because of what my mom brought me up under. And so it's like, I ain't rich. I'm really happy for you. And everybody can't really say that. Everybody really, like, they think about themselves or they think, about, oh, what are we going to do for me or this and that. Like, me, I'm really happy for a person. And all that comes from that foundation. That foundation set me up for the future. You right. know, and I, like, I, now it was boring. I was, it, was, it, was, it was really boring. You know, when you're young, it's like I just, I just like to watch the Cosby Show. I just like man Thursday nights Cosby Show. I'm like, no, nah, we gotta go to the, we gotta go to Kingdom Hall. I'm like, damn, go here. Where's Kingdom Hall? Stay. The Kingdom Hall is where you go for Jehovah Witness. That's the church, you know. <laughs> so it's like, so I can't watch the Cosby Show. I can't do none of that. And then as I start getting old, I start getting a great appreciation for that. You know, like right. man, this is what it is. Like I don't, I don't take on that religion, you know, but that foundation was set. And I don't know, is the man up top preparing me for, man, you're going to come into success. You're going to be a successful person and all this stuff right here is going to make sense later. And that's the way I kind of look at it because, you know, I, did, I never got birthday gifts. Mm-hmm. You know, I never got anything. And that's why, like, I have a greater appreciation for anything. If somebody does something for me and it's genuine and it's real, it means more to me than it probably means to other people. You know, if somebody comes and, you know, they're just kind of there. Because, like I said, I, in high school, you know, it was like, you know, I was one of the most popular people. It ain't like I got something. You know, it's like I ain't, right. I ain't get nothing. You know, it's like, hey, you going to college. Hey, make sure you go get a degree. You know, it's like we don't know if you're going to pro, but, hey, you got a degree. And, I mean, you got a chance to get a degree. You going to college, you know. You right. got you got a scholarship to the University of Miami, you know. So that's that's that, a big that's, deal. That's <laughs> major. You went you went to the U when when the U was like the U. <laughs> you know, we had to build that up. We built that up, you know, because the U had had its issues, and we had to build that thing back up. But we built it back up, you know. The the, the Coaching staff, the university, everybody got together and said, "Man, we got like what we're going through right now. We mm-hmm. we got to tighten this thing back up because we had we had those um sanctions and all those things that right. was over our head." But you know, I still got a scholarship to the University of Miami. You know, I'm getting a scholarship where I don't have to pay to go to college. That's a big deal. Huge. One thing. One thing. When I ask you about who 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 is Edge, right? I grew up watching you. You know, for you know, from middle school, high school time, and I see a guy it's with dreadlocks. Oh man, <laughs> hey, we it's all old school. now, man. Like, <laughs> hey, we old, bro. You, hey, look, we gotta embrace it, man. I just had a birthday the other day. I just turned thirty nine, man. It, you know, yeah, getting up three man. behind. I'm in the fours, boy. <laughs> you ain't yeah. too, you ain't too ahead of me. <laughs> but, but you know, when I grew up watching you, bro, you had the long dreads, the the gold teeth. As I look at you now, brother, you you you, you change a little bit. You don't you don't look yeah. like the same edge, and that's why I said, "Who is the edge, man? What 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 mm-hmm. uh, like you know? I'm, I just want to know, like in life, what transpired where you went from uh, the edge that had the long hair, the gold teeth, 
but you you during during your playing days you refused to to get rid of, and now I see you life after football, and you look a lot different. Well, I think it's the evolution of edge. I think everybody, you know, throughout your life, I think throughout like throughout your life, you turn to like five, six, seven different people, and as you <laughs> as you elevate and you evolve, you know, certain things. No, doesn't really interest you. You know, it's mm-hmm. like you know. At first, you have like I had longer dreads. You know, I had with the gold teeth. But those are phases of your life that you're interested in. Mm-hmm. But the beauty of my situation was nothing was forced. Everything came at its own time. It's like it's like right now. You know, like when you go to the club. Like I like to tie, tie a lot of things to the club. I'm in the club life, but. And shout out to One Miami and all the different night life things. Like <laughs> but the thing that it's like you're 18, you can go in a club and you're eligible. To go. They have a club where it's 18 year olds, right? You can be 24, 25, you still can go in there. You can be 30, you can still go in there. 35, you can still go in there. You know because you're eligible to go. But at some point in time in life, you say, hey, even though I can go there, I don't want to go there no more. Mm-hmm. You know, it's nobody force you. Nobody stop you from saying, hey, you can't go in this club because you're eligible, you're old enough, you're doing everything right by law or whatever. But you say, man, nah, that I'm past that. Right. And that's where I'm at in certain things. You know what I mean? In certain things, I'm past that. I'm past certain things, but it's not by force. It's not where somebody said, hey, you can't do this or you have to do this. You know, it's one of those things where you like, you're like internally, you just say, man, like, nah, that really don't do it for me no more. It's like I'm not going to no club with no kids. At. I'm right. not going to no clubs where I feel like we got to have our shoes tied and we got to be ready. Be ready to go. You know, like I don't, <laughs> I'm not on that. You know, mm-hmm. it's like not that I can't go. It's just I'm not into that. Right. And so when it comes to yourself as a person, you know, I think everybody evolves to a point where you say, this is where I'm at. And you start saying like, I kind of like this vibe right here. I like going over here. I still can be out, and I still can be amongst the people, but I don't have to be in these situations that I was up for 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Like, you expecting, yeah, we're going to go in the club. You know, shit, we might have to get into something. We might, that's fun, you know, and that was our fun. And so I don't want to be in here. You got this grown man in here, and you know, he kind of messing up the party because this is the way we vibe, you know, and that's the way we vibe at that time. And that's what it's all about. You know, with myself, I grow, you know, and as I get in different circles, I grow, and I try to continue growing and growing and taking myself to another level. And the thing that I want to do is I always want to be an example, you know. I want to be an example to where it's like, man, look, how was you? And that's why I can relate to the youth so much. I can relate to so many people. I can relate to people in general because of the fact that I was them. And I can say, man, at this point in time, this is what triggered me to say, man, now nah, I'm kind of past that. you know. And you'll get there. You'll get mm-hmm. there when, when your time comes. But have fun. you know. Go right. do all those things. And I'm not going to tell you what not to do, but understand that if you do those things, be willing to accept what comes with those things, right? You know, and that's my way of teaching, and that's my way of even talking to my children. Like, hey, you know, like everything in life, you know, you have a, a choice, you have certain decisions that you have to make, and depending on the decision that you make, the outcome is going to be there. Are you willing to accept the outcome? And that's where I'm at with everything. It's like, hey, I like this outcome of where I'm going. I ain't. I ain't trying to go in there and be tussling with nobody. I ain't right. trying to go in there where somebody gonna be shooting the spot up, you know. But at one point in time, it was cool. Right. Um, I think that that that's some amazing, you know, feedback because I think we get a lot of times where people um, kind of get stuck in in those mindsets of like wherever you were when you might have been younger, and they just they locked into that mindset. Um, a question I ask every one of my guests, and it's kind of like right around that time, and it's like, uh, give me a regret. Something that, like, through your life that you kind of harbor on or think about that you wish you would have done a little bit differently. 
I don't really have too many regrets. Part regrets. Part of being me is being pure. You know, I like move with my heart and I move where I'm at. You know, so I don't really have too many regrets. And if I had to look back on my life and I look back on the opportunities that was afforded me, I would say I've crossed paths with a lot of successful people and I never let them in. And it's not my fault, it's my upbringing. It was the way that I was raised. Like I ain't trusting nobody, I ain't mm-hmm. letting nobody in. And in hindsight it worked because it's more bad people than good <laughs> people that come at you. So I kept out the bad people, but probably blocks, huh? I blocked the yeah. good people. So if I had to say things that I wish I had a better assessment, and that's where having those mentors, having those father figures, having those people in your life could sit up there and kind of cipher through and say, man, look, now this is a good dude or this and that. Don't push him away. I push everybody away. Like, nah, <laughs> I'm over here, man. Like, I'm good. You know, like, mm-hmm. man, I got to fight for myself. You know, I'm just fighting for myself. I ain't, I don't need nobody else because when I needed somebody, nobody was there. So now I'm like, man, I got it. You know, and mm-hmm. everything I got is more than I expected to have or anybody expected me to have. So I, I'm in a comfortable space, but I probably could have been so much farther up if I would have let people in. How, how much yeah. further are you trying to go, man? You done did some amazing stuff. With, like I, I mean, mean, I still go to the airport. You know, it's like to my party going like <laughs> it's like, man, I think I think you always have to like reach for things that are attainable that are far. You know, it's like you can sit up there and be content. You know, you say how much farther do you want to go? That's like a person that's kind of like limiting me or sitting up there saying, hey, I got restrictions on you. You know, it's like, put me in the same conversation of the person that has everything. You know, it's like, I think life is a chase. You know, you got mm-hmm. to keep a chase. Once you lose your chase, it's like people that, you take a person that's worked all their life and all of a sudden they retire. For some reason, they just die, you know? It's something about the chase. And for me, I don't think I'll ever stop chasing. You know, I don't think I'll ever stop, stop chasing because the things that life affords you and things that you can obtain, you know, and the amount of people that you can help, it's right. endless. Right. You know, so me, I'm I'm never going to stop chasing. I'm never going to stop sitting up there trying to mm-hmm. better myself and be an example because we need examples. Absolutely. You know, from a cultural standpoint, we need examples. We need people that say, man, look, I went through what you went through. I did what you did. And look, I'm able to obtain this. And so we need so many examples. I think these kids are sitting up there looking at so many bad examples or they're looking at unrealistic examples to where you need you need to be an example and you can help this group. Not saying one group is better than another, but our, our, our culture needs more examples. We need consistent examples that saying like this is what you can do, and then you'll see it helps the whole. I, I couldn't agree with you anymore on that one. Um, one of the things that you know when we talk about being examples is, you know, for me, I I got a I was an undrafted free agent, um, ended up hurting my foot and getting released, and um, recently I just you know. NFL season is about to kick off. Uh, you got the 90 man roster comes down to 53. And there's so many dreams that get cut short. So many people that thought they had an opportunity or thought they were going to be the next best thing that now they get smacked back with reality. I remember when uh, Will Lewis called me and told me that they were no longer using my services, the depression that went through me. Um, I had always been in every level. I played the best player on my team or or one of those guys, and then the reality of like having a dream that we all chase for so long, we come from the hood or whatever, we we chase the sport. We chase the dream, the idea of being able to use this to be what's going to propel us to another level. And um, me personally watching, like even like watching like Hard Knocks and all these different shows, we see people's lives, 
you know, when they get that hard call and they or that that decision that their 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 career path that they set their whole life towards uh, is no longer real. Um, so, so for me personally, you know, I like to show people a different side um, and be an example of like what success can look like even without having the sport. Uh, because for me, man, like I I thought I was gonna have a Ray Lewis career. Yeah, I thought I was gonna be the next Ray, and then now I'm 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 sitting at home and I'm depressed because the only thing that I knew that could save me was now gone, because that's what I thought in my mind it was football or nothing, and you know now to be in the entrepreneur world and be doing real estate and you know now this has made me millions of dollars and made me more money than I made you know as an athlete, uh, you know it just it, this is something that's so positive that I love showing it to our youth showing it to people that look like me and you who now say okay dang man i okay i don't have to be in the streets i don't have to be a ball player but there's other opportunities to be able to come in and, and now use my intellect to get me further i've looked at like coming in this in this building and i've seen one all over everything bro you got it looks like you got like every brand <laughs> you got everything going on you got it looks like clothing line club uh uh, what else you got? Uh, what, Everything. It's, I just, man, like, what are you into? Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. It's like, first of all, you sit up and say, what am I? I'm into the nightlife. I love the nightlife. I like being outside. So mm -hmm. I go get into the nightlife. I get clubs. I have a gentleman's club. I have regular clubs. I'm involved in the nightlife. You know, if you think about the three necessities of life, food, clothing, shelter. I said, man, let me get over 50%. So let me get in the, the clothing and let me get in the shelter. I deal, the, I deal with the real estate. So I just think it only, it's only common sense. Mm -hmm. It's only common sense to get involved in things that are necessities. And plus, what are you into? It's like I never feel like I'm working. You know, everybody like, and you chilling every day or you don't, but I'm working, but I'm having fun. You wouldn't know if I'm working or if I'm having fun. Right. And once you get to that space right there, that's a good life because most people are living a life that they're trying to make an ends meet and they're not really happy. Like I'm really satisfied with what I'm doing because every day I'm doing something that I don't mind doing. And if I was working another job, I would take the money from that job and put it into <laughs> these things that right. I already have. So that's what I did. I said, I'm only going to do things that I'm into. I love to read books. You know, I like to read. I like information. I wrote a book, a gold teeth, the gold jacket. You know, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to do Hold nothing let me interrupt that doesn't you real make quick. sense. Hey, y'all, first off, man, um, gold teeth, the gold jacket, where can we get the copies at? We can find it on edgeandjames.com or you can go to Amazon. Just so y'all know, man, first and foremost, this brother is 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 getting it done. <laughs> the four by Peyton Manning. It, it, that's lit. called the big dog zone, you know. Yeah, like, <laughs> but you know, it's like, you know, it's not it's it's one of those things where it's like I never like to rely on nobody. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But at the same time, when you're doing things. It's like you can't be too proud for to be like, man, let me call P because this is my boy and we done put in some time, but I'm not going to be so proud for to be like, I'm not going to say, hey, can you do my forward? Because you know the answer is going to be yes. But I think too many times from a cultural standpoint, we're so prideful to where we would not ask somebody, will you do this or will you do that when it's an easy yes. Right. You know, like, oh, I don't mess with the east side. I don't mess with the west side. I, and I, and I, and like, from a business standpoint, man, I see so many of our people restrict themselves because they can't do this, or somebody gonna look at them like, why are you sucking up to this person, or why are you calling on to that person, or you know, when it's like, come on, man, like, I have a relationship with this person. You know, yeah. I'm cool with this person. You know, if it wasn't for y'all, I'd be over here a little bit more. You know, and so it's like, come on, man, like. Once we understand or once we learn that everybody's needed, it's not that you're dumbing down or you're sucking up this person or you're switching out. 
to where it's like it's business, you know. And for me, it's like I could easily go and do the same thing. I don't have to call. Like I'm, I've never been somebody to name drop or this and that. But that's truly my friend. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So it's like if that's my friend, like why not say, hey, look, I'm doing this. Um, I'm putting this thing together. Hey, would you be? A, would you take part in it? Right. And but we're so prideful because we've been taught to be like so prideful the way you say, okay, yeah, I don't ask this or I don't do this, I'm not doing that. When it's like, it doesn't even make sense to where if you are right with somebody or you dig in the way somebody do so, or somebody can help elevate you, why not sit up there and say, hey, man, hey, can you do this? And they can say yes or no. And they man, say that, no. That's what I did with you, bro. I reached yeah. out. I went, hey, look, I said, man, we got... We got Edge. I, bro, I sent Automatic. you. Listen to me, man. Y'all think I'm joking, man. I was sitting in the gym, and I just happened to check my phone for something. I don't know how I saw your name, but I was like, damn, it would be dope as hell to get Edger and James on the show. I sent you that message. They asked you, no bullshit. They'll tell you. I looked. I said, oh, shit. He just responded. I'm tell you, pull and, up. And, and, and that's... And that's the one thing, like the pride is something that 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 we gotta we gotta remove. I mean, it goes both ways. It goes both ways, right? It's like if you don't remove it, you just one less player in the field. You know what I'm saying? For the people who don't sit up there and put their pride in the way or sit up there and restrict themselves, you know, now they have more opportunities. It's like Think about it. If I say, man, I only mess with the west side. I done eliminate the whole east side <laughs> from me taking myself to another level, right. from me being who I want to be. And I think that's one problem we have as a culture. You know, we restrict ourselves too much. I don't know if it was planned that way or whatever, but we got to fight through that. We got to sit up and say, man, look, if I deal with somebody or if I feel like this right here can advance me or these things right here are good, we have to take that pride <clears throat> and put it to the side because it's about the bigger picture. Because I don't care how prideful you are, once you become that big dog, everybody rocking with you. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. and so everybody play all these games and sometimes it be those people that don't have nothing going for themselves or don't really have potential or they, they like insecure that they hold you back. Yep. It's like if you ever get around real business people or you ever get around real like positive or influential people, they understand like, man, this life is about people. The more people that you can engage with, the more people that you can like interact with, the better your chances of being successful. But we restrict ourselves too much. And it's one of those things where it's it's hard but at the same time, once you get the confidence to say, man, I'm just going to do what I do. And that's that's what I, I've always been my own person. You know, it's like, man, you say, oh, yeah, I don't mess with this person. All right, that's you. You don't deal with them. All right, cool. I crossed paths with them. They was cool with me. It's cool. I like, it's okay. Now, do I have to put them together? I don't have to bring them together. It's more t- enough time in the day. And you can restrict yourself if you want to. But I'm not going to restrict myself. I'm not going to restrict myself. I can't talk to this person because you have a personal problem, because you and the girl or this and that. You got all this stuff going on. Or you might see somebody say, oh, this girl is not this. This girl is not that. It's like you forgot you left out to you. You know what I'm saying? To me, <laughs> it might be a different thing. Yep. And that's a big problem that we have. You know, And I can't, I can't speak for everybody, but... If you're around a lot of the other cultures, they doing business. They can be done cuss each other out every day, this and that. But when it comes time to sit across from each other, man, they gonna put that paperwork, they're gonna do this, they're gonna do that. Our culture, man, I ain't coming. I ain't I ain't doing it. And when we say why are we so far behind, look at all the little things because man, we some sharp people, man. We very sharp, you know. But we're not sharp when it comes to mentality. the mentality. Yeah, because we sit up there and we restrict ourselves. 
it's like, you know, you say you're, on, you're in your own way. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we're in our own way. Not saying all the time, but sometimes we're in our own way. And then you look at the dude that he could be like square or he could be somebody that's not the most cool dude, but he's steady elevating, he's steady elevating. He's just playing that game the right way. Playing the game. He positioned himself, and now you see him being the big dog, the boss. And you're like, hey, how you get there? And you can sit up and do all the talking you want to, but he's there, you know? And not saying that you have to suck up to people, not saying that you have to be something you're not. I just think that you have to understand, look, man, this whole thing is about people. You know, if it's 300 million people in the U.S., I want to connect with every one of them. You know, but if I say, man, I only deal with males, I just eliminated it. Eliminated some. Yeah. I only deal with blacks. I eliminated myself. I only deal with this. Every time we sit up there and put a restriction on something, we cut ourselves out of an <clears throat> opportunity. And that's one thing that I try to be more conscious of. You know, it's like, I ain't going to say, I'm not going to say you're supposed to deal with the bad people. Right. And what you deem as bad is that's a personal decision. You know, you can say, okay, this dude is bad or it's not good for me or this and that. But let it be real. Let it be something where it's um it's really has some substance. And you say, I really can't take it. Now if you say, Oh, I'm only gonna deal with this type of person, okay, cool. Be willing to accept. I don't want you sitting right here saying, Oh, my friends don't support me. Oh, these people Listen, dude, you 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 don't support yourself because you restricted yourself. I don't want to see all that. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? So I just think in this world, everybody needs each other and at different points of life, you know, not saying that you have to go over there and be this. They're like, oh, this dude over here acting this or he acting that. No, nah, dog, like this dude understand what he's trying to accomplish. Um, I can't help I- – I'm such a I'm such a football fanatic, man, and a, and a fan. Uh, I gotta ask you some football stuff, and then we're gonna jump back on some business here in a second. But bro, you played on one of the most prolific offenses in in NFL history, um, bro. You hey, you Peyton Manning, Reggie Wayne, Marvin Harrison. Um, I mean, just a lethal um, offense. Why the hell did you go to Arizona? Well, you, when, you know, it, it, football is a business. You know, it's a, it's a business, and it comes down to, dog, do you know your worth? If I told you, listen, man, I, I like you as a person, but it's out of my hands, and I need you to work for this amount. But you know anywhere else, you know, you're worth this amount. You put in a lot of work. Right. Then you go back to the basis of what you're coming from. Like, I'm coming from nothing, so every dollar means something to me, mm-hmm. you know? So you have to understand, when you walk into that NFL world, it's a business. Take the personal out of it, mm-hmm. you know? So I've always took the personal out of it, you know? The Colts, one of my, I mean, the Colts, that's my organization, you know? They can really do no wrong to me, you know? They've been too good to me, you know, regardless. So when it comes time to make a business decision, you know, you can't make a personal decision. You can't sit up and say, man, well, I'm edge. I love this place. I love this and love that. It's still a business. You remember what I came to? I walked into a business first. Right. And so business becomes first. You no know, business before personal. And always keep it in that order. Sometimes people put personal before business. You can't do that. So for myself, it's like I understand that we have a salary cap. There's rules that's in place. There's only so much a team can allocate to certain players. And if I'm a player and if I sit up there and say, dang, I want this and I deserve this and I put in all this work to do this, but on the business side, this would tear down the team. Mm-hmm. This would make us a franchise that wouldn't be able to produce. You know, I had to sit up and say, man, you know what? They need to do what's best. And so that's where everything came down to. Mm-hmm. But you have options. You know, you have options. You know, it's 32 teams, so there's 31 other teams. And within all that right there, you don't sit up there. You don't become bitter. Like a lot of guys, they become bitter. They worry about this and worry about that. You remember, I just met these people six, seven years ago, you know? And 
my connection to them is what I can do for this organization. You know, and so it's not like these people birthed me. You know, it's not. It's not right. same my mama. You know, <laughs> so you sit back and like, dog. Like I understand what I came into, and then you start saying, looking at all the different options. And so I looked at the options. I made my comparisons to this, that, and everything that I knew at the time. And I said, man, look, I got a chance to go to Arizona. They got two wide receivers, Larry Fitzgerald and Quan Boyd. They have a Super Bowl MVP quarterback, Kurt Warner. You know, they have everything. All they're missing is a running back. They have a good defense. You know, they have everything in place. So for me, I'm like, man, and then they have a black coach. I'm like, and it, but this black coach was the one that my coach was under. And I was like, man, I'm Dungey is the man. So mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, the guy that taught him. To my Dennis Green. Yeah, Dennis Green. Mm-hmm. I got a chance to go play for Denny Green. And it has nothing to do with black coach, white coach, but I'm like, that's your comfort level. You're like, okay, right. look, there's so many connections that says this is not bad. They need a running back. They have the receivers. They have the quarterback. They have a defense. They have everything. Okay, but yeah, it's Arizona. All right, cool. And I'm edge, man. Like, I'm coming from Makali. I'm coming from the middle of nowhere where ain't one of the poorest cities in the whole fucking state. So, I'm not tripping. And then I get a chance to get compensated because you have to remember, why did I come to the NFL? Why did I want to play the NFL? Paid. I wanted to make sure that I'm able to change the structure or change my family outlook on things. So, let's keep the main thing the main thing. you know. So, I put as much energy and effort into the thought that I could and say, this is a no-brainer, man, Arizona, you know? Yeah. Do you feel like uh, more players should should look at it as a a business versus? I see because I, I do see a lot of players that personalize the business of the NFL, and it is a business. I mean, like shit. The first time I got hurt, they got they got rid of me, and I was like, that's when I realized the NFL wasn't about talent, and it was like it was, are you available? Are <laughs> are you not available? You out of here, man. I mean, you'd be foolish to think it's personal. Mm-hmm. Hey man, I don't even know you. These people don't know you. They don't know you at all. They don't know nothing about you personally. You know what I'm saying? It's a business. So keep it business. And if you keep it business, everything else will fall in place. Once you make it personal, that's when you you tread on thin ice, you know, <laughs> because you making it personal when these people don't even know you. It's like it's gonna be another guy. It's always another guy. You want injury away from not even being on the field. Right. So if you don't treat it like a business, I've always treated it like a business. That's why nothing fazed me. Nothing can phase me when it came to that sport because I've always treated it like a business. <clears throat> it didn't phase you when uh the boys went won a Super Bowl right after that? I was there. I was hanging out. You know, it's like, <laughs> shit, I get to hang out. You, you have to understand, like, if I don't make money, it, fa- it, it phases me More. because now my purpose was to take my family out of this situation. You know, like, I man, <clears throat> I got dudes don't offer me their Super Bowl ring and all this stuff right, for money. You know, so it's like, those are the telltale signs that let you know, like, man, those rings are cool and that moment is cool, but at the end of the day, it comes down to, man, who gonna pay these bills? Who gonna take care of my family? Who gonna be able to help this situation when it comes? Because that's what this world is about. It's a capitalist state. I'm a capitalist world. I'm the United States, that's where we at. You know, like, if you don't, I don't care what you've done in the past, if you don't pay the rent, man, you getting up out of there. Mm-hmm. And that's the that's just the basis of it. That's as simple as you can make it. So I've always understood that. You know, so I understood the assignment. I understood that, look, man, I don't care about all the other stuff. The bells and whistles, they're cool. Now, of course you would love to be Super Bowl MVP. I want all this. I want all that, you know. But at the end of the day, when these people come knocking on that door and they tell your mom that, hey, the mortgage hasn't been paid, you can't show them no Super Bowl ring. You got to show them the money. And so I've always kept that in perspective. Mm-hmm. You know, I never deviated from it. And anybody that deviates from it, they fooling themselves. Right. Because 
Just think about it. Look at the facts. The facts are what they are, and I live my life on facts. Just look at it. You know, I don't care what you've done in the past. You know, yesterday's scores don't win today's ball games. I don't care what you did in the past. Right now, it's about hey, what you gonna do for this man? Are you mm-hmm. gonna pay this man, or are you gonna get up out of here? What's your proudest accomplishment in sport? In sports, um, you know, I went to two franchises that wasn't um, doing well, and both of them end up being um, some powerhouses in the NFL. And it's not made it to the NFL. I don't think nobody can can look at that and say, "Look, man, I made it to the NFL." You know, the NFL is a big thing, but not only the NFL, I made it to the Hall of Fame. You know, so when you sit up there and say, man, I'm putting on that jacket, that jacket means something. That jacket only comes out every now and then. So if I just say the most proud of the accomplishment is the way I went about it and the things that it took to get there, it has to be the Pro Football Hall of Fame. That's dope. All right, give me your top three running backs all time. Mm, top three running backs all the time. I mean, I'm just going to keep it in the order that they have it, you know. But Jim Brown would probably be my number one. That would probably be my number one, Jim Brown, because Jim Brown was ahead of his time. And then you can you put – I can see why you say Jim Brown. Yeah, Jim Brown legit. I, I I went back and watched some of your highlights today, and I was like, <laughs> Jim Brown, like he's a man, like that's how you played though. There's a did man's you, man. Did you, you kind of form some of your game around? I didn't. I didn't really know Jim Brown. He, he came before me, right. so you learn about them as you go. But as you go, Jim Brown is a man's man. You know, when you start looking at it, like Jim Brown is probably number one, and in, in my mind, and then you can always mix Barry, Emmy, however you want to put it. Mm-hmm. You know, you say you say top three. I'm always put those three because like Emmy Smith to be able to, you know, to be able to, to sustain <clears throat> and play that long and play at a high level. He's somebody from Florida, you know, and he represents the state. And you know, Emmett is somebody you will sit up and say. Yeah, Emmett, but then Barry. Barry didn't have that many opportunities as far as players, and he come from a he come from a place that's they don't win a lot. Right. And to be a running back, man, to Barry to be successful week in, week out for ten years straight, knowing that all your work go. For nothing, because Detroit ain't really win nothing. You know, they never won nothing. And imagine if he had that extra motivation. So I would put Jim Brown one, and you could throw Barry and and Emmett however you want to do it. You know, right. however you want to put it. Like All that's right. how I would. Look I heard at you it. say Emmett was from Florida. Um, we talked earlier about uh, Fred T. Yeah. Give me your top five running backs from Florida. Mm. I'm never gonna put myself in the equation. You gotta be in the equation, man. You gotta go, Jack. Stop. I mean, Stop. I, I, like, I, I, nah, you, I got, you, you in the equation, bro. You in the equation. You gotta go, Jack. How many of them got go, Jack? When they Emmett? ask, Fuck. when they when they talk, go, Jack. Well, that's that's when they talk to you. When they talk to you, you do it. <laughs> you know, I'm always. It's like, man, I'm 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 big time. Fred T. Fred T. My boy. He's like, but he's like Fred T. One of my favorite. But Emmett first. Emmett first. From the state of Florida, I'm University of Miami bad, um, bias, so I'm always do that. But I'm going Emmett first, Fred T. Fred T. Gonna be because I want Fred T. To get in that Hall of Fame, like he deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. Like that's you. one of my favorite players. And from the state of Florida, so I don't know if they had to be birthed in the state of Florida. That's 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 tough, man. Like that's tough. Is I'm going with all University of Miami backs. I ain't so mad at that because y'all had some it. y'all had some dogs for sure. Yeah, like Frank Gore gonna come up. Frank Gore, CP, Willis, like 
I'm doing my stuff, University of Miami, but I got to get. Did y'all give... all play at the same time though? Nah, we didn't play at the same time, but we all we all understood the assignment. Yeah. Who? Because I remember at one point y'all had like a crazy team. I can't remember. It was like ninety. 99? No, nah, that was like 2001, 2000, 2001. I had just left, but all them boys was together. So you had Frank, Willis, Portis, all them together. That's so crazy. So I'm going to put them in my three of Florida. But I got to give Emmett, he's like the big dog. He's the yeah. godfather. You know, it's like you can never discredit that. Fred T, one of my all-time favorites. Like I, I just always like Fred T. Like we grew up in the same areas. Like we grew up like 30, 40 minutes from each other. Mm-hmm. So we always knew of each other. And Fred T is one of my just favorites. Like if you from a running back standpoint, right. like if you had to, if you had to sit up there and say, okay, this is what I want a running back to look like, Fred T would be it. You know, that's that's what I would put in number two. And after that, you can put them however you want to. Frank, CP, Willis, however you want to go. Yeah. And I'm just the coach on the side. <laughs> Say, hey, let there them go, go in. Hey, my man, my man's so humble. He's in the Hall of Fame and don't even want to put himself on the list. That tells you everything about him, man. That's that's crazy. Uh, I, it, it, it's so many things that I just want you know I want to ask you because man, you got you got a wealth of knowledge. I I realize you know I watched your interview with Shannon Sharp. And um, he talked about you being cheap, or people calling you cheap, and and, and it and it it was really impressive to hear you talk about just being disciplined and how most of the guys that called you cheap ran out of money or probably broke now. Um, life after football is something that a lot of guys struggle with with the transition. Uh, recently, I found a lot of guys reaching out to me because they're on that back end of their career where they're trying to like get more business savvy and trying to get, you know, organized, whether it's through real estate and ownership and things of that nature. Uh, who was it that pushed you in those directions? Was it just something that you made that decision? Like what what was the preparation that you made to, for as far as investing in, and, and taking, you know, the after life football, after football life more seriously, business wise? Well, it starts from your roots. You know, my grandfather, you know, he led a lot of people. You know, he was um he was a business person, so I come from a business savvy, but old school business, not the paperwork, this and that, but like street business, like mm-hmm. this is how you do a handshake type thing. So you come from that, and you start to get a better understanding of people. And so once you start learning, you know, people, you move from there. You mm-hmm. know, it's like I never trusted nobody. You know, everybody said, oh, you got to trust somebody. You gotta trust. I think, no, don't trust nobody. If you don't trust nobody, that means they have to give a little bit more effort to gain your trust or get inside. So when they say, hey, you should trust, say let your let your guard down, you shouldn't be so guarded. So I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that people make. They trust. Now show me your hand every time. Mm-hmm. You know, if you show me your hand every time, then we can move forward. You know? <clears throat> so I live off that. I ain't trusting nothing. I don't care what it is. I ain't trusting nothing. Show me. You got to show me. And so when you start from there, and after they show you in a step-by-step process, you know, the con man's game is speed. I come tell you this. I talk real fast. I go do this. And then all of a sudden you just, yeah, okay. Athletes get frustrated. I understand athletes get frustrated because the entourage, everybody laughs when you say this little corny joke. You know, they say, um, yeah, you're doing this, you're doing it. Yeah, 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 that means nothing. You know what I'm saying? So you so you just have to put it all in perspective. You know what I'm saying? Now, get around real people. Get around real people that really don't, not going to laugh at your jokes. Get, get around people that's going to sit up there and sit up there, take you for what you really are. You know, so that's the basis of where I'm coming from, you know. <clears throat> What um give some advice to the youngsters that's in the NFL right now, uh, business wise, because like you get the the guys come in, they get that check, you know, never had money before. From from a from a veteran standpoint, what type of advice are you giving a guy that's coming in now to to make sure like they don't go broke and that they can have, you know, a life that's comfortable after football? Well the first thing I like I never understood why like do nothing, you know. You don't have to do nothing 
and you're still going to make the money you're going to make. You know, educate yourself. Get involved with real people. Real people come after you sit around and you sat up there and you've dissected them, and there's no clock on real people. Con people, there. There's clocks on. There's clocks on con people. They have a time. People that isolate you, they're not good for you. The people that sit up there are not willing to tell you, hey, hey, go let everybody check. You know, go let everybody check it out and then come back and see me. Those people are good for you. So have these systems in place. I've always had these systems in place to where it's like, hey, if I got to sit down and you give me this material, but you put a time limit on it. Time limits are the worst thing. You're already playing ball. You're playing ball. You're making your most money right now. So make sure that you educate yourself enough and you understand, like, don't be pressured by the clock. The only clock you have to worry about is the game clock. That's where the real check's coming from anyway. So doing nothing is very important. And a lot of people get, a lot of those kids get pressured thinking, you have to do this, you have to do that. But, hey, do nothing. Do nothing. Educate yourself. And then surround yourself with people that don't need you. Mm -hmm. I think that's very important. If you sit around people that don't need you, that holds you accountable, because I'm not going to be somebody that don't need you and you're going to sit there and pull your little, I'm going to be late, or, hey, I'm on my way, but you really in the house. I'm not doing that. And that's where the – it's a lot of little things that lead up to why these problems happen. Athletes are – or a lot of time the young athletes, they're in a situation where, you know, they're comfortable. They're comfortable with people that just – Yes, yes, yes. They have a bunch of yes men. A yes man is never good. Mm. You know, you have to remember, a yes man, you know, he says yes to everything and anything. And you're not the only person he says yes to. So you have to surround yourself with the right people. You have to get a core of people that sit up there. They don't need you. They're not going to be yes men. They're backed by facts. They're going to tell you what you need to do. And you can go to anywhere at any place, at any time, and it's going to stand up. And then once you get those things in order, you say, yeah, this is my guy. But you have to have self-accountability. Right. A lot of these guys don't have self-accountability because they're used to more people just agreeing with them, telling them what they want to hear, and it feels good. But the reality of it is, is you still need to answer to somebody or you still have a lot to learn. It's like... The amount of money you make don't make you know everything, you know. It just make you more vulnerable. And a lot of these guys are so vulnerable, they don't even really understand it. They don't even really get it. And by the time you wake up, it's too late. You're an older guy. Mm -hmm. But you have all these people around you that's just telling you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anytime a person says, yeah, every, like nobody's right all the time. You can't just be, you know, you need to really – Speak on facts, and I see it all the time, and it's is it's heartbreaking, but at the same time, they got the money. The money can move the needle. The right. money can surround them with a bunch of people that is going to say what they want to hear, and the best people for you are not recruit. They're not good recruiters. You know, the best recruiters the people that's not good for you because they have more time. They spend their more time. They spend more time and energy into the BS or telling you what you want to hear or agreeing with you versus, like, the answer is what the answer is. No, you shouldn't do it. No, this doesn't make sense. You know, so if I had to talk to a young person, I would say, man, look, get you some discipline. Get your team in order. Or you're going to find yourself living in regret. Mm -hmm. What was the biggest check you've ever received? Oh, throughout the years, I made, I, mean, so I, think, I think it was probably my, um, my franchise year. I was getting like four or $500,000 a week. 
so that was that was good money. But like nowadays, it's not a lot of money compared to some of the guys. Yeah, like what does it? It's like four, five hundred thousand a week. All right, so you you get four or five hundred thousand a week. How the hell can you listen to anybody or take advice from anybody when you're making that much money? That's the problem. It depends on who you are. You know, I'm a system person. You know, it's like we come through, get everybody, get all the information, come up with a system. If I'm going to get four or $500,000, it's going here or it's going there. I'm not even focused on the four or $500,000. I'm focused on what I got to do. I'm always thinking about the next move. Mm -hmm. I'm always thinking about, okay, yeah, that money's made. You know, I don't have to worry about that money. I'm always looking for the, the next opportunity. But, you know, with a lot of other kids or a lot of these younger kids, you know, they may look at it and say, oh, it's four or 500000 I can spend ten, twenty. You have to remember where I'm coming from. You know, $20,000, that's a salary for a person. Right. You know, so I'm, li- I'm looking at things different, you know, and I always look at things different. Did you ever get caught in the trap of like knowing you got a half million dollars plus coming next week, so I'm, I'm gonna spend two, three hundred? Nah, I never. Nah, because I like you. Have to, you have to go back to my base. My base. I know where I'm coming from, and I have a purpose. You know, I understand the purpose. I understand the assignment. To where every dollar means something. You know, it's like I used to go out and do this work. You know, I used to do this work. I used to work in the water in the field. And I never forget this number, seven two seven four thirty five. You know, it's like I work seven AM to seven PM and this dude hand me thirty five dollars. You know, so money means something to me. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like when you sit up there and say, Man, dang, I did this hard ass work and got thirty five dollars. But I ain't trip on it, you know, cause that's what the job entails. <clears throat> My man sitting here with a North Carolina A N T hoodie on. Absolutely. Uh, I went to a HBCU, um, went to Winston Salem State University, uh, right down the road from A N T. Um, coming out of Black College, man, it was one of the most challenging pieces for me. Right, you, you're understaffed. The equipment, the food, the training is basically non-existent. Um, I remember as an athlete going to Wake Forest University to do my workouts. I used to literally go down to Wake to try to at least have like a, a, a you know a decent area to train and things like that. Um, right now, Prime is at Jackson State, and you know. He's like one of the guys that you see, like really, you know, bringing more attention to the HBCUs. What's your What's your opinion when it comes to uh, HBCUs and sports and having like a fair shake at even being competitive when you're so understaffed? Is not the money's not even the same, the coaching's not the same. Would you? First of all, what's your opinion on that? And in addition to that, would you allow your child to play at an HBCU? You know, it's, it's, it depends on where you're sitting at. You know, because at first, you know, as a, as a parent, I know the challenges. As a football player, I'm like, damn, my child go to HBCU. He's going to have to do this. He's going to have to do that. But then you start looking at the bigger picture. Start looking at the big picture. It would never change if you don't have the prime, if you don't have the people that sit up there and say, these are the things that affect us. And that's a cultural decision that we have to make. We have to sit up and say, we're going to do things to help our HBCUs, help our people. And it's easy to go to a PWI because PWIs, they're funded and they have the best facilities, they have everything that you need. And as a parent of four kids that attended HBCUs, you know, it's a purpose behind it. Mm -hmm. 
if we don't do it and we have the financial means, we have the resources, if we don't do it, why would you expect somebody else to do it? Why would you expect a father that don't have these resources to do it if we don't do it? You know, and myself, when my son decided to go to Howard University, you know, we went down the checklist, you know. My son is good, you know, he's 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 gonna be pretty good, you know. And he could have went to a PWI. <clears throat> is that football or basketball your son? Football. Playing? Football. Plays football. And it's a conscious decision to say, okay, look, man, you understand that, look, you understand the assignment, you understand that, look, man, it's not going to be like a PWI, but to break barriers, to take things to another level, you have to say, I'm willing to do more. And that's what, you know, I think Coach Prime and I think the guys that's all gravitated to this situation. When I look at that kid that was the number one rated kid in the nation to go to Jackson State, that says a lot mm -hmm. because, man, we love each other. We love right. each other more than we actually want to give credit, and we love each other more than people want to acknowledge or really point out. But at the same time, it's it's nothing like an HBCU experience. The know? experience is amazing. Like, I'm just going to tell you, man, going to Winston-Salem State and be, definitely being a dominant athlete, man, I – I loved it. I mean, you get uh, all the love. You get. I'm on everything. I'm. <laughs> yeah. You know. You. But. But. The reality when it comes to business. If I had went to Wake Forest University, if I had went to North Carolina State, if I had went to UNC, I would have been drafted, no doubt about it. Now coming out of Winston Salem State, first thing you hear is, "Hey, you level of competition. You level of competition. You level of competition." That's the knock that they throw against you. Uh, to make it to where, you know, they they basically find a way to devalue you, you as an athlete. <clears throat> but you can that that right there is not a valid point because one of my favorite running backs of all time went to Jackson State, Walter Payton. Walter, yeah. Walter Payton went to an HBCU. So it really comes down to man, are you good enough? Are you really good? Are you really that deal? Jerry Rice, HBCU. Michael Strahan, HBCU. Bob Hayes, HBCU. It, the list goes on and on. So people can sit up there and poison you or they can distract you with all these things. But the reality of it is, let's get back to what it really is. It's a business. Mm -hmm. you know. And if it's a business, just be good. If you're good enough, they're coming to get you. They're coming to find you. The problem I see is the distractions and being able to overcome the things that it takes to be a great player. And as a parent, I made a conscious effort to say, look, if we're going to this school, I'm prepared to step up when the school don't have this or the school don't have that. That's dope. I'm prepared to step in when these situations occur. But let's identify them first. Right. And once you identify those things, you say, okay, you know what? This is not really that bad. Because regardless of whatever or however anybody look at it, you're still African-American male in the United States of America. And when football is over, when they've gotten everything out of you that they can get out of you, you still the guy that you are. And from a cultural standpoint, who most likely to be your clients if you're a business person? Who are you most likely to interact with as a person? So as an advantage, I think it even makes more sense if you're a business person to say, look, I'm going to a HBCU because man, deep down inside, I know who my client's going to be. My daughter is at North Carolina a and She's going to be a plastic surgeon. You know, she's going to be one of the best plastic surgeons the world has ever seen. You know, you think her client's not going to be of African-American descent? You know, and so let's be realistic. So you have to have those conversations. You have to really be realistic and say, these are things that's going to happen. These are things that's really going to matter. Look at the end result, because when you go to any firm, 
if you go to any, um, say you're a lawyer, I have a daughter that's an attorney. I said, most likely your, your client's going to be African-American. You know, you don't see a lot of African-American attorneys represent all these other races. They stick with their people, you know. So we're getting a head start on it, you know, and you call it like it is. You can say it how you want to say it. You can sugarcoat it. You can this and that. But this is the way this world works. This is the way America works. And for me, I'm a realist, mm -hmm. you know. I'd rather my daughter go to uh, HBCU to where she has built a relationship with this HBCU and her people that she's more likely to have clients because she's in business. You know, if she's going to be a plastic surgeon, you think she's going to have all these other other um, cultures or ethnicities come and say, hey, I want you to do this, I want you to do that? No, most likely it's not. You know, they go to their people, you know, and it's nothing wrong with that. Right. So for me, it's like, man, let's get ahead of this thing. Like, this is what it is, you know. Name one African-American attorney that all his clients are of another descent. You're not going to find that. You know, you're not going to find that, and especially consistently, you know, but every time you look at it, you'll see of a person of another culture or of another race, and they have everybody, you know. We only get limited to our people, and if we get one of those people, they're people coming with restrictions or with situations, you know. It's not... It's just that's just the way where America works, and there's nothing wrong with it. But it's like we have to sit up there and wake up and say, "This is the reality of it. Let's let's do us a little bit more mm -hmm. than accepting the status quo." Well, I'm gonna tell you, man. Just <clears throat> hearing your 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 perspective on on HBCUs, you, I mean, I just got I gained respect from you from the time that you responded to my DM. Gained even more respect when I I come here and I meet you as a man. But as we have as we have further this conversation, and I'm listening to you, you know, with with like for, forward thinking when it comes to the support, you know, all, you said four children at HBCUs. Four children. I got um, six, and four of them are already at HBCUs. So, that, like, you walk it and you back it, and that's something that, like, you know, a lot of people love talking about. Oh, I'm about my culture. I'm about my people. And then they go do the exact opposite. None, none of their actions actually match um, the stuff that they're saying. But when I listen to you, Edge, and I'm, I mean, like, this is impressive, bro. Like, to hear you say, "Hey, look, if 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 Howard University is lacking on something that I can be a part of and I can assist, I'm gonna assist with that." If if we had more guys that. Even heard it, and, I, and I'm glad that you're even vo ver verbalizing it and vocalizing it because I had a, I was on another podcast, and I had said it flat out, I wouldn't want my kids to go to an HBCU because of my experience there. You know, football wise, meeting people and all that, it was amazing. But when you, when you had so many limited, for me personally, the limiting resources that kept me kind of at bay. Uh, was a big deal. And to hear you be like, hey man, like not only are my children here, but I'm gonna be a part of the solution by making sure whatever resources are lacking, I can be a part of assisting it. Man, I gotta take my head off to you, bro. Like we need more of that. And if we get more people that definitely of your likeness, Deion Sanders and more that start, even people knowing that you guys are having this, like even knowing that is huge. Because, just like I said, my experience was so, I mean, bro, I, I'm from North Philly originally. I go into Winston-Salem State. And, you know, I'm thinking I'm going to college to, to like, get away from some certain things. And then you you experience some of the hood shit that you deal with in school. In addition to that, the school was limited in, like, the resources and all the shit that you need to be a top-notch player. If but, we get, Like, for... And that, that's the thing. It's like, how is it going to change if you take that approach? It's never going to change. It, you're right. It'll never change. So for me, it's like you. we can all do the basics. Everybody can do the basics. Hey, this is how it goes. This is how it goes. But who's going to do step up and do more? You know, and, and for me, it's like, man, look, dude, you going, you going to Howard University? 
guess what? Everything that they lack, I'm gonna fill in. Shit. You know? Hey man, everybody this man don't is a legend have to, and so many yeah. different. Yo, yeah, that, like that's crazy. That, that, that's but that's unbelievable. That, but that's but that's dog. That is the reality of what it is. Because sometimes, man, as a culture, we see ourselves bumping up a little bit, other, and we so we're so eager to get ahead that we forget about man. Like, dang, you know what? Can like I just look? Can you do more? Like, just ask yourself, can I do a little more? Like, if I sit up and say, dude, like you said your part, right? You said how you looked at it. You said how you said that. If I sit up and say, dog, the things that you went through at Winston-Salem, you know, could you do a little bit to help that, to prevent that? And if the answer is yes, that's the solution. That's what it's going to take. For us to go to the next step, we have we Pell Grant gonna be late. I already know that. You know what I'm saying? Like it's gonna be late. It's gonna. You know what I'm saying? Like this was so. Let's like man, like we built like like man, we built like that. You know what I'm saying? Like like let's sometimes man, we take out the special of being black. You know what I'm saying? The special of being who we are and what has happened to us in the past that made us to who we are. And sometimes, man, like we we sometimes feel like we just want to take a break. You know, sometimes some parents say, man, I don't feel like dealing with this right now. But it's like, man, this is who we are. And it's like, dog, like, look, we know we're going to be late. Eight o'clock means nine o'clock. Like, it's built in. You know what I'm saying? So you have to sit up there and say, man, look, I'm, I'm with that. Okay? I tell my daughter, like, hey, look, Peregrine going to probably be late. I ain't no big deal. Whatever. We're going to get it all worked out. But your teacher's going to love you. They're going to love you more than if you went somewhere else. Because those people, and, man, I promise you, man, the teachers at HBCUs, they really love their students. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about it's totally different. If you, As a <clears throat> parent, you know, I come through it in a different phase. You know, I come to it. Like, I, I started going to HBCU at... 38, 39, whenever my, whenever my daughter went, you start seeing the passion from the teachers. You start seeing like, man, like this this thing real, you know? And other places it's just, it's a course. You know, you do this, you do that, mm -hmm. but you're an athlete, so you get treated a little bit, you know, yeah. like, okay, yeah, we gotta do this for, for the athletics. So they're doing the betterment for the whole. But when you go to an HBCU, it's like, man, those people really love, our students, man, you know what I'm saying? And once you get into your mind, man, we going to be a little late, you know what I'm saying? Cultural, that's what we do. Like, we ain't showing up to the party on time, and you think that the Pell Grant, you think the, all the grants, you think this and that. No, put that in the equation. Let's go ahead and put that in the equation. But overall, you're going to say, man, dang, now I beat the system because I was already ready for it. Mm -hmm. You know, when they come say, "Hey, Daddy, I didn't. They didn't put me in." All right, cool. We're gonna call this and that because we are already ready for it. We right. ain't gonna sit up saying, "Oh shit, they they late. They did no. We already know this part of who we are, mm -hmm. and now let's make this thing work. And that's where I'm at with it. And just to clarify for y'all, like um, HBCU love. Athletically is what my challenge was. We just got to be very clear on that because I don't want people yeah. to think like I didn't like the HBCU nah, experience. I, I look it's at the, the same. It's the I look athletic at athletic piece where it was so limited. Man. It was like when you, you know. No, 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 no. I'm and and this is what I'm saying. I'm I'm speaking as a whole right, first. Right. Athletically, it's like a high school, a big high school. I can promise you that. But it still comes down to, dog. If you a dog, you a dog. Now, if you gonna get distracted, if you gonna get distracted. It's a bunch of women. It's a bunch of distractions. <laughs> hey, that's you that, that's, that's, the, one, that's the, the one thing I'll tell you. Like being at an HBCU, you know, and definitely being one like the man on campus, you know, the women that that's it's a distraction. <laughs> that this, but this is what I'm saying. Like you have to remember, like dude, like you have to remember where I'm coming from. I'm coming from one of the poorest cities in the state of Florida. So if you give me a weight room with Dumbbells, a squat bench, and a bench that has actually weights that's more than enough. 
You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I can't sit up there and accept that, oh, athletically this and that. You know what I'm saying? When I know that, okay, a PWI, they're going to have, they're going to examine you, they're going to have this, they're going to have that. But at the end of the day, man, man, 225 pounds is 225 pounds. I don't care what bench you put it on, you know? And so if you're determined and you say, man, I really want to put in this work, I really want to be there, you're going to do the thing. And then your frustration, the things you had to go through, all those things going to make you even more of a dominant player because these dudes, they had to do it when everything was the perfect conditions. You had to go out and step outside of yourself and say, man, I really want it. You know, And right. that's where I look at from HBCU. It's like, man, I'm going to always have respect for a Michael Strahan, a Jerry Rice, you know what I'm saying, uh, Randall that played for Minnesota, Minnesota, you know what I'm saying? Walter Payton. Because like dog, boy, y'all did it the hard way. Right. You know, I went to the University of Miami, you know, we got our own grit and grind. We have a different type of thing that kind of lifted us. But when you're talking about dudes that had to make it like really get out of the mud, HBCU players, you know what I'm saying? And if any one of them <clears throat> sit up there and embrace it. What was it? Two thousand Maybe 2006, I think this was right, or 2005, 2006, I come to uh, UM, I'm working with DJ Williams and and Bill at, 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 for a workout. I go to the U. So it's like my probably my first year out of college. So yeah, it's like 2006. I walk in that bitch, y'all got color-coded plates, sand boxes to, to, to work out in. Everything. I'm like, I hey. see why these niggas is good, man. But hold up. That's the bottom tier of PWIs back then. The Bamas and all those dudes that's rolling, they took it to a whole nother level. You see what I'm saying? It's different yeah. levels. But I don't care how you sugarcoat the weights, this and that. Still 135, 235, 300, 400. Hey, look, let me tell you. When I first got to Winston-Salem State, bro, we worked out what they called the dungeon. <laughs> Niggas in <laughs> Niggas didn't have hardly no weights. It was so bad. It was like, you you were better off going to Planet Fitness or something like that to get a workout in. Uh, but they did eventually get, they're better now. The weight facilities are getting better. You know, over time, money's went into the program. But when I first came in, I'm like, bro, I went to Wake Forest. I, I yeah. trained at weight during my, you know, during my time just to See, be those, able to have the facilities. But those, those are the things that, you know, it, and that's why I say, like, that's why I say I have a lot of respect for those guys that made it. Right. Because those guys didn't let those things get in the way of them becoming. You know, it's easy to say, man, dang. And especially, especially now, you know, it's like now you can win a kid over with uniforms and yeah. nice this and nice that. But when you get down to the core of it, you know, the weights are the weights. Are you willing to work? Are you willing to do what it takes? You can sit up here and say, well, this guy has it better. This guy has it better. Or oh, this guy has this, this guy has that. When I when I see a kid doing though, I see anybody looking at somebody else's situation. Every time you look at somebody else's situation, you take away from your situation. That energy you could have put in yourself, you know, you put it in like giving yourself an excuse, like a mm -hmm. built-in excuse. Because if you fit the mold and you're willing to work, man, you're gonna come out and now you can make a difference. And that's what we need now. And I think everybody's praying on the fact that. The kids love the flamboyant things. And everybody comes from different situations. Mm -hmm. Like they might say, you're a five star, you're a this, you're a that. And so it looks good, this and that. But then every time that draft come, you see this unrestricted. This guy is a first, a one star. This guy nobody ever heard of. Because they found it from within. And that's what makes you special. You know, because it's easy to do everything when everything is laid out. It's perfect, you know, the right conditions, and now it's hard for you to fail. But you say, I've overcome this, I've overcome that. And as a person that's coming from Immokalee, Florida, I'm like, look, dude, nobody can tell me nothing. Like, I know what I overcame. You know, I know what it took for me to get where I'm at. So I have a greater appreciation for it. And when I see somebody that's up there and whine and I see somebody that complains, I'm like, man, you – you tripping or, you know, it's like really they, oh, you don't really understand. It's like, have you ever been to a third world country? 
You know, have you ever been over there and you see how those people appreciate certain things? You know, that's what it's like. When you go into an HBCU, you say, okay, look, I know what I'm getting myself into, but when I make it up out of here, you know, you're going to know I really made it up out of here. And that's the difference. <clears throat> Who's the best player to come out of uh, University of Miami? Depending on what you're looking for. You know, best, like, give me your best offensive player, best defensive player, all time. Hmm. Man, the you we roll together, man. Like, I don't really like we, we don't divide each other, you know. That's it's not like, a divide though. It's it's somebody it's the cream comes to you, who got gold jackets out to you? See, you gotta remember gold jackets come from the Pro Football Hall of Fame, like what you did as a pro. You have some people that was great in college and it just didn't translate. So when it comes to the University of Miami, man, I'm not I'm not putting nobody ahead of each other like we we man we mob man we mob together man <laughs> like I'm I'm sticking with us you know it's the you versus the you. everybody man the you. That's, that's how we operate all right uh, next question um, who's the best player that you played with uh, in your career like just in general offense defense don't matter well the best overall player had to be Payton man you know Payton like this man football was like the dual life you know and then to watch you know a person go one franchise to another, still win it, but the to watch the growth, you know, because like when I went to Arizona, I mean when I went to when I went to Indianapolis, you know, it was three, it's still a three and thirteen team, you know, but to watch it grow and watch it turn into something become special that became a team that the whole world took notice on. And it's all because of that guy. You know, that guy really did what he had to do and committed to the game. You know, and it's like when I, when I, I sit, sit back, back and, and I, I say, man, I was around somebody that really committed their life to the game of football. And they reaped the benefits of it. You know, a lot of us, you know, like, I came with a purpose. I ain't come from a house that had this, had that, and I was just playing for fun. You know, so we all have different agendas. But when you see somebody just say, man, the NFL, I love this game. I was born to be this and be that. I gotta give it to P Money. You know, P. That's his name, P Money? Yeah, he, really, he made all the money. In the world. <laughs> <laughs> like, nah, like, but not, not only like that, like a good dude, you know, like yeah. a good dude, you know, it's like, you know, like, just like a solid dude that you can really say, man, you know, we don't really have too many friends that you can say, man, dang, this is my white friend or whatever. <laughs> like, like, man, P can pull up to the barbecue, P can hang out, and it's cool, but well respected, you know, no matter where they went, you know. So I got a lot of respect for, for P. And if I had to say the best player that you've ever played with, especially when it comes to the game of football, that dude love football. Like more, he really love football. football. Respect. Respect. Um, um, all right. All right. No, 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 um, life, life out after, after football, football, obviously you're in the entrepreneur world. world. Uh, but I, I've heard you probably, probably 15, 15 times, times even before we cut the camera on mention the kids and the youth. Like, like I heard you just like, like yo, yo, I care, I care about, about the kids. kids. I care about the youth. youth. And like, like, I keep I hearing that. that. Where does that, that passion, passion come from, and like, like what's really your focus with giving back to uh, the community? Well, it, it comes from being, you know, when, you, when you're one of the guys that was in that situation, you know, you can relate to it, and anytime you look at the kids, you see yourself. You start thinking back. I don't think nobody can sit back and see a bunch of kids and see a bunch of kids doing stuff and not have a little moment with like, dang, that was me. So... For me, that's where that stems from. And to make us better as people, you know, we need to make sure that when you get in these positions, you can't just take these positions for granted. You have to take these positions and understand that you have an obligation. It was a reason you was chosen. Why you was chosen, I don't know. But the fact that you're chosen, don't sit up there and be selfish. Don't hold all the information because anybody that's successful has a lot of information. Mm -hmm. They have a lot of information. And that information 
is to be given. You know, you receive information and then you give information. And the people to give it to is the kids. You know, you can give the same information to somebody your same age or a little bit older or around there, and they'll disregard it. Give it to a kid, you know, it's going to travel. It's It's going to carry carry on. on. And when you teach somebody something from the first time or you take one of these kids and you say, hey, this is how you do this, usually the first time you learn how to do something, that's the way you do it. And if you got a chance to show them the way to do it and how to do it, and it's a successful way and it's a positive way, you just help the world. You just Mm -hmm. help the world because you showed them how to do things the right way. way. And Mm -hmm. the kids are the future. They are the next generation. They are the ones that's going to be doing the things that you're doing or doing the things that they see. And I think it's very important to sit up there and provide them with all the resources, all the information to where they're going to be able to carry it on. You know, if they sit up there and they see you going for bad, they're going to probably go for bad. Mm-hmm. But they see you doing things that's good and doing things that's productive, they're most likely going to hang their hat on that. And that's the time when it's a blank canvas, when it's, and it's nothing that's instilled in them that sticks when you have a chance. So it's very important to make sure that you, you provide them with so much information that they can utilize and actually benefit from that they'll see it. Because once they see it, like, hey, this right here really works, man, they're convinced. <clears throat> With you being so successful, uh, I just want to, uh, like, and we're talking to the kids right now, we're talking to the youth. Uh, there's so many distractions around for these kids nowadays. Uh, the, you know, the even from, you know, video games to the music, is so much like, you know, whether it's drill rap or whatever, where we got a lot of people that are like jumping into gangs and jumping into like this crazy lifestyle. You come from an area that is tough and, um, you know, obviously like, you know, you said it was very, very poor. What type of things mentally did you do to stay clear of all the, of all the, the your surroundings? Because our environments are so toxic sometimes, like, our environment can lead you down the wrong path and take you away from amazing opportunities. What type of advice or things could you give to the youth in far, as far as tips to, to make sure that they avoid the pitfalls of growing up in tough areas? The, the most important things are examples. You show the people examples, you show the kids examples, and you see them through. You sit up there and show, okay, this is how you become this. So a lot of games they say, hey, I want to be LeBron James. Okay, let me show you what it took to become LeBron James. Let me show you the commitment he actually had to the game. You know, And I think a lot of times people are just looking at one side of things. Somebody say, hey, I want to be this rapper or I want to be this entertainer. There's nothing wrong with that. But you have to see the whole. You have to understand that everything that everybody went through to become and once you look at the the big picture, you see it all, you can say, okay, yeah, these are the things you have to do. These are the things that made them become who they are. And a lot of the time, everybody just getting these real glimpses. It's like a little, everything is like a snippet. You know, mm-hmm. it's like, yeah, you know, my Instagram started out with 15 seconds, then it moved up, and now it's one minute. You know, it's like, and so you get like a snippet of a person's life, but look a little bit more, uh, look a little bit deeper into what it took to become, right. you know? And these are the things that you have to do to become these people or put yourself in these situations. Not You have to have talent. You have to have something special about yourself. But regardless, even if you have all that, you still have to have that discipline. You have to have that work ethic. You have to have that thing that's going to say, hey, man, I'm not going to be like everybody else. You know, it's this thing of everybody doing it. It must be easy, you know. So the people that stand out are the people that stand up there doing things that everybody else not willing to do because it's easy to go with the flow. You know, like crowds are made for destruction. You know, the world is ran by the few. And, like, are you going to be the few? Or are you going to be the person that stands out? Or are you going to be the person that just goes with the flow? You know, 
And like if you go with the flow, is is it's a lot of y'all, you know. The from from gold teeth to gold jacket, um, is a hell of a statement. It's a hell of a book title, but more importantly, it hits on I, I, I it hits on so many things: dedication, discipline, hard work. Um, can you give me just like a couple real things, quick tips? We're gonna wrap on staying disciplined even when you don't see the end goal or or you're not already you're not being rewarded because so many people are looking for instant gratification. We just talked about Instagram and seeing these snapshots and everything else. The work that's required to put that gold jacket on, the work that's required to see a project to us it's in. Um it's important. I think a lot of people don't really see that part. Can you just you know just touch on the type of work ethic that you had to have, discipline, et cetera, to make and hit your goals for your life? Well, I start with faith. You know, faith is like, this thing, you can't really see it. You got to believe in it. You got to know it's there. So you have to, you have to have faith, you know. And once you, like, have that faith, the faith is the foundation of everything. That's, that's, it kind of gives you your why. You know, you start saying, man, like, I know it's going to happen. I believe it's going to happen. I'm doing everything that it takes to happen. So it starts with there's different layers, you know. And then it comes to identifying, okay, what's your end goal? What are you really trying to accomplish? And while you're trying to accomplish all these things, there's going to be all type of distraction. That's when the discipline kicks in. You know, the discipline it comes to where, hey man, the like they always say the devil always come in to test you. You know, somebody gonna always come to test you. And you have to really understand that, man, when you're trying to accomplish something, somebody gonna come to get you off your square. Somebody gonna come to distract you. And the fact that you notice somebody's coming, it's easy to block out. Like when I'm doing things and things are going good. That's when I feel like, man, I'm at my most vulnerable. And I'm just waiting on that moment. I'm anticipating that moment because I'm like, I know something about to come up because I already know I'm rolling too good. Life too good right now. You know, something is something about to come up. And then out of nowhere, it just comes up. But I already anticipated it. That's I've real. already anticipated because I know when I'm doing things the right way and things are rolling for me, something's going to come. And all that do is say, man, that was a test. Dang, I passed. I passed mm-hmm. that test. And now consistency, consistency comes in. And so now I'm just going to be consistent in what I'm doing. I'm going to keep just keep chopping wood, just keep going at it, keep going at it, you know. And then you go back to faith because I know it's going to happen. So you keep going. You go faith, discipline, consistency. And you start saying, okay, look, you can keep going. You keep going. You're like, man, I don't know if people heard of the um, – the story of the Chinese bamboo tree, you know, when you look at that, I mean, look up that story. I think anybody should look up that story. It's a very inspirational story. But you just keep going, but you have to have that faith that it's going to happen. You have to have that discipline to not be distracted, not to be distracted. And then consistency, you just keep doing what you're doing. And then out of nowhere, you know, sometimes I look out like, man, like I always say, man, God going to get tired of me um, sitting up here harping on this and harping on that because I ain't giving up because I know it's going to happen. And he's going to just say, man, you know what? Let me just give it to him because, you know what? Man, this man, like, I'm getting on his nerves. Or he like, man, this man deserve it because I'm going to stay at it. And that's been my approach. And that's been, like, my, like, like, I believe in that. You know, it's like I say, man, look, I know what I'm doing is the right thing. Am I hurting anybody? I ain't hurting nobody. Mm-hmm. Am I interfering with anybody? It's like you find a space to where it's, man, I'm not hurting nobody. I'm not <clears throat> doing nothing to hurt nobody. And I'm actually trying to help people. I'm trying this and that. So I know I'm in a clear lane, you know. And then it's like, okay, I got to stay disciplined enough because, man, when you become successful, when you, time you start, start doing things good, it's going to be some times that are going to test you and it's going to go to the things that, that we all have vices, mm-hmm. you know, and sometimes that vice is going to test you. It might be something that, that would normally trigger you, 
you know, and if it normally triggers you, then you put in that space to where it's like, and what am I gonna what what am I gonna do? Am I gonna am I gonna go for it or am I gonna play past it? And you play past it and you feel good because like dang, that was a chance that kinda got me off my square. And that's where that discipline comes in. And so I'm gonna get back to doing what I'm doing. And that's kind of my routine with everything. That's what's up. Um we got a legend in the building, man. I'm so thankful for your time tonight. Listen, so I do like I do live events, man. Uh have a few thousand people out. I'm gonna have to get the edge. I'm gonna try to I'm gonna try to get the edge to come mm. out and pull up on y'all, man. The edge will pull up, man. Um I tell I talk in third person. It's like the <laughs> other person, you know. Hey, like, when you got a gold jacket, bro, you can talk in third person all yeah. day long, man. I'm I'm like so thankful for your time tonight, brother. Um, you really like you know, to get to meet you and to hear your thought process. Um, definitely on a couple of topics when it comes to like the HBCUs and things like that, man. You just really like wowed me. Um, I appreciate and, it, and and I got mad respect for you. Uh, make sure if you haven't already done so, you guys go follow Edge. Uh, we're gonna tag all the socials at the bottom. Uh, I'm gonna see if I can't get a couple of these books. Can we get a couple of these books, Edge? Definitely, yeah. Twenty five dollars. Yeah, 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 it's yeah, about yeah. business too. You look, know look, what I'm look, saying? Look, look, so like, what we're gonna do is we're gonna we're gonna get like I'm gonna get like ten of these, right? I appreciate and, um, that. We gonna get like ten books. I'm gonna see if I can't get Edge to sign them. And if if you if you follow the uh, the show, if you follow the show, get your ass up, and you go follow me and the Edge, you'll be eligible to win one of the ten books that we are gonna get from the Edge, man. So uh, y'all make sure y'all go follow. You come subscribe to the channel. We got a living legend, a Hall of Famer, and go get the book for y'all for everybody that, that to go support Edwin James from Gold Teeth to Gold Jacket. Uh, this is going to be an amazing book. I'm looking forward to reading it. And I appreciate uh, your time, Edge, man. Respect. No, nah, man, anytime, man. You already know, man. Thank I you, man. I like what you're doing. Thank you so I much, brother. Um, I appreciate you, it. I, I, just once again, you wowed me when you told me that you came and said, hey, whatever shortages they have, I'm willing to stand up for. You have and, to. And being from an HBCU, man, that shit sent chills through my body, brother. You have to understand, man. Is the the difference and the the difference between winning and losing is so close. You know, it's just those small things. And if you're willing to do those small things, that way that will kind of level the playing field. And the fact that we coming from where we coming from, that's gonna take us over the top. Respect, brother. Thank you for uh, joining the show, brother. That's a wrap. That's a wrap for today's episode of the Get Your Ass Up podcast. Thank you so much for joining me in this journey of learning, growth, and self-improvement. I hope you found value in our discussion and feel inspired to apply the insights we've shared to your own life. If you enjoyed the show, please don't forget to subscribe, leave a five-star review, and share it with your friends and family. We're committed to providing you valuable content to our listeners, and your support continues to help the growth, and I want to over-deliver on that promise. I'm your host, Tony DeClose, and I want to remind you to never stop striving for greatness. Keep pushing yourself. Never give up. And remember that we're all in this together. Stay tuned for more empowering episodes continuing our way to success. Until next time, keep moving forward. And remember, get your ass up and make that shit happen.